This is Space Time, Series 20, Episode 46. Coming up on Space Time. New clues as to why matter dominates over antimatter. Detecting new types of gravitational waves. And the Saturnian moon that tipped over onto its side. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Physicists have found evidence for a weak preference of matter over antimatter. The discovery, reported in the journal Physical Review Letters, is still far too small to provide any real proof of an imbalance between the way matter and antimatter act. But it might provide the first tantalising clues of some new physics beyond the standard model to explain why the universe appears to be made up mostly of matter rather than antimatter. The standard model of particle physics describes and predicts the behaviour of all the known particles and forces, and consequently it's the foundation stone of science's understanding of the cosmos. Antimatter is just the same as normal matter, but with the opposite electrical charge. So, the negatively charged antiproton is the antimatter counterpart to the positively charged proton, and the positively charged positron is the antimatter counterpart to the negatively charged electron. Science's current understanding of the creation of the universe tells us that equal amounts of matter and antimatter were created in the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. The problem is, when they come into contact, matter and antimatter annihilate each other. All that's left are gamma-ray photons. So, technically, the universe should have been destroyed within moments of its creation. Yet, clearly that didn't happen. And that means something is missing from science's understanding of the standard model. This violation of symmetry, known as the charge parity or CP violation, has been observed in a number of different experiments. But none of the results are conclusive enough to explain why we live in a universe primarily made up of matter rather than antimatter. Or for that matter, why we don't live in a universe made up of equal amounts of both. The new discovery was made during a study to examine the rates of neutrino and antineutrino oscillations. Neutrinos are among the least massive yet most common elemental particles known. They're also the most weakly interactive. There are literally billions of them passing through you right now. Neutrinos come in three types, known as flavours. There's the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino and the tau neutrino, each with their own specific characteristics. Further complicating matters is the fact that neutrinos continuously oscillate between these three different flavours. Japan's Tokai to Kamioka, or T2K, collaboration has been studying neutrino and antineutrino oscillations as part of their search for CP violation. The scientists are using Japan's Proton Accelerator Research Complex to fire high-intensity beams of muon neutrinos and muon antineutrinos to the nation's Super Kamiokande neutrino detector. As the neutrinos travel the 295 kilometres from the accelerator to the detector, they spontaneously change flavour from muon neutrinos or muon antineutrinos into electron neutrinos or electron antineutrinos. However, instead of equal amounts of both being detected, the detector discovered a very slight but very real preference for neutrinos over antineutrinos. Some 32 electron neutrinos compared to just 4 electron antineutrinos. These findings are still far too small to make any definitive claims. Nevertheless, they are intriguing. The experiments just completed a second set of neutrino beam events, collecting another set of data, effectively doubling the amount of information available. And scientists are now processing this new data with the highly anticipated results expected to be available later this year. The experiment is slated to run for another 10 years, which researchers hope will provide a significant trend in the CP violation effect. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A team of astrophysicists have proposed that permanent scars left in the fabric of space time by gravitational waves could be used to study exotic hypothetical cosmic events such as primordial black holes and one dimensional defects in space known as cosmic strings. The study, reported in the journal Physical Review Letters, identifies a new concept which the authors are calling orphan memory. 
Professor Albert Einstein's 1915 General Theory of Relativity predicted that cataclysmic cosmic explosions from events involving superdense objects, such as merging black holes or neutron stars, physically warp the fabric of space-time, stretching and contracting it by producing gravitational waves. So far, there have been three confirmed and one probable detection of gravitational waves made by LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory's twin detectors in Washington State and Louisiana. All of them involved merging stellar mass black holes, and each resulted in tiny distortions in the fabric of space-time no more than the size of a proton and lasting for just 0.2 seconds. But the power of these distortions was enough to ripple through billions of light-years across the universe. The researchers from Melbourne's Monash University who identified the new concept of orphan memory claimed that after a gravitational wave event, space-time remains stretched out. The term orphan alludes to the fact that the parent wave isn't directly detectable. By working out exactly how currently theoretical objects like cosmic strings or evaporating black holes leave behind scars of their existence in the fabric of space-time, scientists might be able to confirm whether or not these exotic phenomena are real. According to the new study, some events generating higher frequency gravitational waves could be easy to detect. However, the underlying permanent memory of that distortion would not be easy to detect. Scientists would need to obtain signatures from a large number of similar events in order to begin building a clear picture of what one of these orphan signatures would look like. The study's lead author, Lucy McNeil, says gravitational wave detectors such as LIGO can only hear gravitational waves at certain frequencies. She says if exotic sources of gravitational waves such as micro black holes existed, then LIGO wouldn't be able to detect them because their frequency would be too high. But this new study shows that LIGO could be used to probe the universe for gravitational waves that were once thought to be invisible to it. This idea of gravitational wave memory, it's a permanent deformation of that space-time that is actually caused by the previous stretching and contracting of space-time. So once a gravitational wave has passed, that space-time is permanently deformed. Tell me a little bit more about exactly how the orphan memory would be detected by LIGO. So detecting this memory signal from objects or like gravitational waves whose frequency is not in LIGO's band. So every, every object that emits gravitational waves should have this memory component, but the point is that it's, it's expected to be much smaller than the dominant oscillatory stretching and contracting. The idea of what we've done is to show that if you have gravitational waves whose frequency is too high for LIGO, so LIGO will not see or this oscillatory stretching and contracting, the point is, is that we would expect if the event is sufficiently close, we think it's possible to see signatures of events that you would think are uh, invisible to LIGO. Is, is this something that maybe Lisa will be able to see better once it's set up? I think we actually tried this and I think it was about the same. So okay. the thing about like thinking about Lisa is that you have a different sensitivity band. So, But yeah, the idea can be applied to any gravitational wave detector. So it's like if the, the dominant oscillatory stretching and contracting is too high for your detector's bandwidth, you can expect to see orphan memory in the detector, but not the main signal. Does this tell us something about maybe the fabric of space-time itself in, in terms of how hard it is? Flexing space-time itself would be very difficult anyway, so you need a really dense object such as a neutron star or black hole to do it mm. in the first place. But once you've done it, that means that what you're telling me is once it flexes, parts of it will stay that way. Yeah, exactly. On Earth, the change in space-time is like you know really tiny so I guess like you're right to say you think about space-time as being really rigid and stuff but yeah that's sort of what memory does it should sort of leave it permanently changed to before the black hole binary merged or whatever but the memory component though is smaller than the the dominant oscillatory gravitational waves but yeah you can think about it. We've talked about gravitational waves opening a new window on astronomy. Certainly, orphan mm. memory with gravitational waves would open yet another completely different window. Yeah, I, I think you're right to say that because, you know, like we were kind of saying before, LIGO can only see 
gravitational waves of a particular frequency or, you know, black holes with particular masses or whatever. So I guess, yeah, the way it's kind of opening up a new window is if there is something out there that is emitting these high frequency gravitational waves that are outside LIGO's band, well, all the sources we've mentioned are pretty speculative and stuff, but... Um, That's what blue yeah, star the way research it's opening, is about, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So it's like if something's out there and it's emitting these high frequency gravitational waves, um, we should be able to see its memory. So it's sort of, even though from the memory signal, you don't get as much information about how far away the object is or things like that. You can still know that there's something there um, emitting high frequency gravitational waves. I guess in doing that, it's like the idea of orphan memory would sort of extend LIGO's frequency band in a way. But like I said, you don't get as much information about the event itself. But the characteristics let you know something's happened and the theory lets you know what you think that's likely to be. Yeah, I guess so. If there was a orphan memory detection in LIGO, the only information we really get out of it is how much did it stretch or contract space-time in some particular direction. So I guess in terms of the theory, it's like all objects that emit gravitational waves are expected to emit this memory component as well because it's sort of gravitational waves from previously emitted gravitational waves. But in terms of going back to the theory, I guess that's why it would be surprising and exciting if there was an orphan memory detection just because we still kind of really have no idea what kind of things could be emitting such high-frequency gravitational waves. The study's co-author, Dr Eric Thrain, says while orphan memory is yet to be observed, these waves could well open the way for studying currently inaccessible physics. So when the cosmic catastrophe and like something happens, like two black holes collide, they're expected to produce these things called gravitational waves, which are ripples in the fabric of space-time. And recently, the LIGO detector, uh, which we're involved with, has announced the detection in the last year of these these gravitational waves. They are not waves that we can experience as they pass through us. You know, we don't feel them, but very slightly they they stretch our they stretch us. And they make us slightly uh, taller and thinner one moment, and then slightly shorter and fatter the next moment. But very sophisticated detectors are required to measure these gravitational waves. And it's thought Einstein tells us that following a gravitational wave event, for example, from two black holes smashing into each other there is an additional effect called memory. And memory means that our space-time is permanently changed, it's permanently stretched by these gravitational waves passing through us. And while this effect has been known for a long time, our most recent work on orphan memory points out that memory can be used in order to look for gravitational wave signals that normally we don't think of our detectors as being sensitive to. In particular, there is a range of frequencies that every detector operates at. You can think of a gravitational wave detector as like an ear, like a human ear. There are some sounds that are so high-pitched that dogs can hear them, but people can't. But it turns out that even these very high-pitched sounds, these very high-pitched gravitational waves, should still have some memory associated with them. And this means that we can use the gravitational wave detectors we have today to start looking for memory from gravitational wave events that might otherwise be uh, undetectable. Considering how many black hole mergers the universe must undergo and how many neutron stars will be out there gently humming away as they rotate, would it be easy to differentiate between different memory waves from gravitational gravitational waves? That's an interesting question. So some memory that we expect to be out in the universe will be associated with things that we can see. And you mentioned pairs of black holes smashing together. Every thousand seconds or so, every 15, 20 minutes, somewhere in the universe, a pair of black holes smash together. If we see the memory from these black holes, we'll also, in most cases, see the gravitational waves that they make. So the gravitational waves from black holes colliding make this chirping sound in our detectors. It starts at low frequencies and ends at uh, high frequencies. It sounds kind of like a whoomp. And the memory from that we'll see, and we'll also see the whoomp, and we can use that chirping sound in order to say whether this was from a pair of black holes, whether this is from a pair of neutron stars, how heavy were the black holes, how far away were they. The idea of looking at orphan memory, though, presupposes that there are more exotic things out there in the universe. As observers, we try to not assume that we know everything that there could be, and we just ask the question, well, what does our gravitational wave telescope tell us is out there? And if we saw memory just by itself with no chirp, 
this would be evidence that there was something out there that was unexpected. And, and we wouldn't really know what it was. If we did see such a signal, the theorists would have to go back to the drawing board and, and try to understand what could cause this. It's a way to look for new phenomena that may have occurred. Exactly. The point of our study is that everything that makes gravitational waves also makes memory. And so we should be looking for memory because if we see this, it might be giving us a hint of some new physics that we hadn't known about previously. The paper's other co-author, Dr. Paul Lasky, says LIGO won't be able to see the oscillatory stretching and contracting, but it will be able to detect the memory signature if such objects exist. He says this realisation means that LIGO may well be able to detect sources of gravitational waves that no one thought it could. I'll start off by saying that I don't think any of these are necessarily likely. They're definitely speculative. There's been a lot of theorists working very hard over a number of years, coming up with different models of the universe, different phenomena that we don't necessarily understand, but that certainly make new predictions. So, for example, one of these is, is a thing called cosmic strings, and these are very exotic things that we have absolutely no idea whether they do or do not exist at the moment. They are incredibly long, sort of cosmological scales, but yet almost infinitely thin strings of energy. And these sort of go crack like a whip. And when they crack like a whip, they potentially produce gravitational waves. And along with that, they would produce a, a memory signal. What would cause them? There's something called phase transitions in the very early universe. So this is where, as the universe is, is evolving very soon after the Big Bang, you get different regions of the universe evolving at different sort of rates and with slightly different conditions. And at the interface between any two of those regions, you potentially form one of these strings. Again, I'll, I'll, it's purely speculative. There's a lot of theoretical work that's gone into it, but we have absolutely no observational or experimental evidence for the existence of these things. But if we were to find them, it would be truly exciting. One of the most amazing discoveries for a long time. But yeah, so they can absolutely produce a, a very high frequency gravitational wave signal, which would have this lower frequency memory component that um, Eric and Lucy have been talking about. Another possibility, I guess, evaporating black holes. This is, a, again, another exotic one. And in fact, people like Stephen Hawking... I was going to say, Stephen sort of Hawking, when he gets too exotic, he thinks this is right on the money. Absolutely. Well, no, look, and I, and I think that there's some very solid theoretical foundations to suggest that black holes should absolutely evaporate. The question is, as they're going through that last throes of evaporation, what actually happens and what's the main sort of processes that occur during that phase and whether there is an, a memory signal that gets emitted. This is speculative. We don't really know. But more importantly, how loud that signal would be and how often it occurs throughout the universe. That's the one that we really don't know. This all depends on how many of these black holes were formed in either the early universe or through evolutionary processes throughout the early phases of the universe. And these are questions that we really don't know the answer to. So I think Hawking would absolutely say that black holes evaporate and that they should evaporate. But the question is, how many of them do so in the, in the universe and how many of them do so close enough so that we'd be able to detect their memory signal? These are some, some of the things that we really have no idea about. But again, it's a possibility from an observer's perspective. If this is something that we saw, I think it would be truly exciting and it would give us a, a really good handle on some early universe physics as well as some physics that's going on in the local universe. I guess that if these black holes were evaporating, to evaporate within the last 13.8 billion years, they would have to be fairly small to start with in terms of their mass, because I think the rate of evaporation that Hawking worked out was something in the order of trillions of years, so for a stellar mass black hole. So I guess we're talking about fairly small ones, which may well have existed at unusually high density locations in the early universe, especially during the epoch of reionization. Absolutely, absolutely. And this is, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of work that goes into this to try and understand what kind of black holes would have been formed during the early universe, what that mass distribution of those black holes actually looks like. This is, you know, what you, basically what you're talking about here. You're saying it's all very well to say, well, there was all these black holes that were formed, for example, more massive than, than our sun, but they're not going to evaporate on the same timescale. They're going to evaporate on a much, much longer timescale than, than what the universe has been around for. So if this is to be a, a thing that we can see with LIGO, then you need to hit the sweet spot of, of what that mass, the original mass distribution actually looks like. And that's something that observationally we have no evidence for or against. So we go out and look. That's Dr. Paul Lasky. Before that, we heard Dr. Eric Thrain and also Lucy McNeil. All of them are with Monash University. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. 
If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and other things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Saturn's ice moon Enceladus may have been knocked onto its side during an ancient collision early in its history. The new findings, reported in the journal Icarus, are based on observations by NASA's Cassini spacecraft, which found evidence that the moon's spin axis, that's the line through its north and south poles on which the moon rotates, has reoriented itself, possibly due to a collision with a smaller body such as an asteroid. Enceladus appears to have tipped away from its original spin axis by about 55 degrees, now that's more than halfway towards rolling completely onto its side. The study's lead author, Radwan Jardine from Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, says Cassini's detected a chain of low areas or basins forming a belt across the moon's surface. Now he believes this belt represents the fossil remnants of an earlier, previous equator and poles. The area around the ice moon's current south pole is a geologically active region, where 140 kilometer long linear fractures up to 2 kilometers wide, known as tiger stripes, slice across the surface. The authors speculate that an asteroid may well have struck this region sometime in the past when it was close to the equator. Jardine claims the geological activity associated with the tiger stripes is unlikely to have been initiated by internal processes. In fact, he thinks that in order to drive such a large reorientation of the moon, it's well possible that an impact was behind the formation of this anomalous terrain. Back in 2005, Cassini discovered jets of water vapour and icy particles including organic compounds, gases, salts and silica spraying from the tiger stripe fractures were evidence of a global subsurface liquid water ocean deep beneath the moon's frozen icy crust. Whether it was caused by an impact or some other process, the authors think the disruption and creation of the tiger stripe terrain caused some of Enceladus's mass to be redistributed, making the moon's rotation unsteady and wobbly. The rotation would eventually stabilise, likely taking more than a million years. By the time the rotation had settled down, the north-south axis would have reoriented to pass through different points on the surface, a mechanism scientists call true pole wander. The pole wander idea helps explain why Enceladus's modern-day north and south poles appear to be quite different. The south pole is highly active and geologically young, while the north is covered in craters and appears much older. The moon's original poles would have looked far more alike before the event that caused Enceladus to tip over and relocate the disrupted tiger-striped terrain to the moon's south pole region. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered a Jupiter-sized exoplanet hotter than the surface of most stars. A report in the journal Nature indicates that the planet Kelt 9b has a dayside surface temperature of 4,600 Kelvin. That's only 1,200 degrees cooler than the surface of the Sun. Kelt 9b is a gas giant, some 2.8 times the mass of Jupiter. But it only has around half of Jupiter's density because the extreme radiation from its host star has caused its atmosphere to expand and puff up like a balloon. Located some 650 light years away in the constellation Cygnus the Swan, Kelt 9b is known as a hot Jupiter because of its close in orbit every 36 hours around its host star, the massive spectral type B blue white star Kelt 9. In fact, this is the first confirmed planetary discovery around such a star. Kelt 9 is more than twice the mass and is nearly twice the surface temperature of our Sun. And because it orbits so close, Kelt 9b is tidally locked to its host star, just as the Moon is to the Earth, with the day side of the planet perpetually bombarded by radiation from its star. This intense heat makes it impossible for molecules such as water, carbon dioxide, methane or molecular hydrogen to form. Properties of the planet's night side, which is in perpetual darkness, remain a mystery. 
Molecules may be out of form there, but probably only temporarily. The study's lead author, Professor Scott Gowdy from Ohio State University, says while Kelp 9b is a planet by any typical definition of a planet based on mass, its atmosphere is almost certainly unlike that of any other planet ever seen because of this extreme dayside temperature. In fact, Kelp 9 is radiating so much ultraviolet radiation that eventually it may completely evaporate the planet. On the other hand, if gas giants like Kelp 9b do possess rocky cores, as theorists predict, then the planet may eventually boil down to nothing but a barren rock. A bit like Mercury, really. Of course, all that depends on whether the star doesn't grow to engulf the planet first. You see, massive stars like Kelp 9 burn through their nuclear fuel supplies very quickly, growing to become red supergiants in less than a billion years, some 12 times quicker than yellow dwarf stars like our Sun. It was back in 2014 when astronomers using the Kelp North Telescope in Arizona noticed a tiny drop in the star's brightness. It was only about half a percent, but it was enough to indicate that a planet may be transiting, in other words, passing in front of the star as seen by us. The sudden dip in brightness would occur regularly every 36 hours, and that means the planet was completing its yearly circuit around the star every 1.5 Earth days. Subsequent observations confirmed the signal did indeed come from a planet, and it also revealed it to be what astronomers call a hot Jupiter, the ideal type of planet for the Kelt telescopes to spot. Gowdy says, given that its atmosphere is constantly being blasted with high levels of ultraviolet radiation, this planet may well be shedding a tail of evaporated planetary material, sort of like a big comet. He says while most exoplanetary searchers have been hunting for Earth-like planets orbiting in the habitable zones of sun-like stars, Planets like Kelp 9b complements those efforts by providing a kind of touchstone for understanding how planetary systems can form around extremely hot massive stars, far larger than the Sun. As science seeks to develop a complete picture of the variety of worlds out there, it's important not only to know how planets form and evolve, but also when and under what conditions they're destroyed. The astronomy team are now hoping to take a closer look at Kelp 9b with other telescopes, including the Earth-orbiting Spitzer and Hubble Space Telescope, as well as the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope, which is slated for launch in an Ariane 5 rocket next year. Observations with telescopes like Hubble will allow the team to see if the planet really does have a cometary tail, and also help them determine how much longer the planet can survive under its current hellish conditions. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. The two-man Expedition 51 crew from the International Space Station have returned safely to Earth aboard their Soyuz MS-03 capsule. Their spacecraft undocked 3 hours and 20 minutes before touchdown, just as the orbiting outpost flew at 28,000 kilometres per hour, some 400 kilometres above the Mongolian-Chinese border. And we confirm separation. We see that the message SSVP... What docking and internal transfer system mode has been completed. We can Over the border between Mongolia and China, the Soyuz MSO-3 now has undocked from the International Space Station. Expedition 51 officially over. Expedition 52 has officially begun. We are moving on to... Undocking occurring right on time at 5.47 a.m. Central Time. In two minutes, you're going to have the first burn. Novitsky and Pesquet have begun the journey home. We'll be standing by for the first of two separation burns. This will be an automated eight-second burn of uh, the uh, Soyuz engines. Burns that will uh, increase the opening rate of the Soyuz from the International Space Station. The undocking was followed by two engine burns by the Soyuz spacecraft. The first moved Soyuz away from the space station while the second, about two and a half hours after undocking, was the crucial 4 minute 21 second deorbit burn, which slowed Soyuz down enough to begin falling out of orbit. About half an hour later, the orbital and service modules were jettisoned from the descent capsule as it plummeted through the rarefied atmosphere on its re-entry. And just three minutes later, at an altitude of 120 kilometres, around 400,000 feet, the Soyuz capsule reached entry interface, where the atmospheric drag starts to cause the ablative heat shield to dramatically heat up as the spacecraft falls through the thicker atmosphere. This causes temperatures outside the spacecraft to reach more than 1,200 degrees. On the old space shuttle, maximum heating usually occurred at about 70 kilometres above the ground. 
the superheated ionised air around the capsule causes a period of communications blackout, usually lasting a bit over three minutes. The first parachutes, including a supersonic drogue chute, deploy about eight minutes later, about 15 minutes before touchdown. That's soon followed by the big orange and white main chute, giving the Soyuz crew their ride to the ground before the soft landing rockets are ignited about a metre above the surface to cushion their final touchdown. Standing by for the firing of the soft landing engines. Touchdown. The Soyuz is back on Earth with Oleg Novitsky and Thomas Pesquet. Landing occurring at 9.10 a.m. Central Time, 10.10 a.m. Eastern Time, 8.10 p.m. at the landing site in Kazakhstan. Oleg Novitsky, the Soyuz commander, in the center seat of the descent module, handing uh, flight uh, documentation and uh, systems books to the Energia recovery personnel. Tomas Pesquet is to his left. The pair landed in clear blue skies on the Kazakh steppe after spending 196 days in orbit. Oleg Novitsky uh, talking uh, to uh, Energia personnel at the landing site. Uh, the uh, temperatures are summer-like and on-target landing for the Soyuz MSO-3. The pair had flown up together with NASA's Peggy Whitson on November the 19th last year. Whitson remaining aboard the orbiting outpost until September following the Russian Federal Space Agency's decision to reduce its space station crew complement from three to two. The three new members of the Expedition 52 crew are slated to launch from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan on July the 28th. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, your favourite podcast download provider, or direct from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. The show's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos and other things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at spacetimewithstuartgary on Instagram... And on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com forward slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts or Audio Boom. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.